came along and ruined our Christmas plans, we were still in Advent. And we had just gotten to the part of the story right before the birth of Jesus. Specifically, we were hearing the story from Joseph's perspective, which, to be honest, is not a perspective that gets a lot of attention, probably because we never actually hear Joseph speak for himself in the scriptures. And by the time that Jesus is an adult, Joseph seems to have disappeared from the text entirely. As such, Joseph often gets overlooked or overshadowed by everything else that happens in the life of Christ. But I want us to spend a little bit of time this morning thinking a little more deeply about this man who had his life completely upturned by God. I imagine at one point or another, we've all been there. We've all had our carefully laid plans completely dashed and had to figure out what comes next. And in those moments, I think we could stand to benefit from the example of Joseph. So let's back up a little bit first. Let's go back to where we were two Sundays ago when Joseph finds out that his fiance has become pregnant And he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is not the father. Joseph was a nice, humble Judean man trying to live a nice, humble life. And I imagine that if Joseph had been asked to do one of those life planning exercises where you write out where you see yourself in one year, five years, and ten years, that maybe he would have written down something like, In one year, I see myself being married to Mary, and we'll be starting a family together. Now, I suppose that a year out, that vision would be true, but I doubt that Joseph would have imagined that to get there, he would first consider breaking off the engagement, only to be visited by an angel in a dream to be told that his soon-to-be wife was pregnant with the Son of God, and that he would become the stepfather to God's only begotten son in a manger. There are a lot of points in that story where it would have been easier for Joseph to just say, yeah, actually, this is too much. I'm out. I had a vision of what my life is supposed to be like, and you know what, God, this this just isn't it. It is an incredible demonstration of trust and fidelity on Joseph's part to roll with the punches in the nativity story, to instead say, look, I don't know where this is going, but I'm choosing to see it through. And that choice on Joseph's part represents a sort of humility toward which we should all be striving. We can make all the plans we want. We can think of ourselves as the masters of our own destiny, but time and again, life will prove us wrong. We will encounter moments in our lives when it doesn't matter how carefully we laid out our plans because something out of our control is going to come in and completely upend them. It might be something big, like Joseph is dealing with, or it might be something smaller, like the bad weather that we had on the weekend of Christmas. The only thing that we can actually control is how we respond to the situations that arise in our lives. And I want to stick with this lower stakes example of the recent blizzard for just a second to help make this point. Now trust me when I say that no one wanted our Christmas Eve plans to go unchanged as much as I did. We'd been working on those services for months ahead of time. I'd already put hours of preparation into er, into the sermon and writing, and Doug had already spent hours getting the slideshow ready. For me, it would have been the first Christmas Eve resembling something like a normal Christmas Eve since 2019. And I know for many of you, Christmas Eve is one of the services that you look forward to all year. And that's not even to mention the reality that for many folks, Christmas Eve is one of the few chances during the year that we have to help them have an encounter with Christ. There was every reason in the world for me to want to be stubborn and push on ahead with our plans to hope that everyone could make the right decision for themselves about whether or not they could get here safely. But ultimately, 
I had to set aside what I had envisioned, what I wanted, because the Holy Spirit kept weighing on me that everyone being safe was more important than a couple of worship services. Five years ago, we had another bad winter storm on Christmas Eve, and my home church made the decision to cancel services. Another nearby church where I was set to record a sermon didn't close. My friend who was the pastor there knew that I needed to record that sermon for the ordination process, and so he didn't call off the service. My family and I set out into the storm, and we made it to the church. But when I arrived, I found out that my friend and his wife had ended up in a ditch driving across the county trying to get there, and suddenly I wasn't just preaching a sermon, I was leading an entire service. Now, with that experience in mind, it was important to me that we not remember this Christmas Eve as the year that someone ended up in a ditch trying to get here, or worse yet, the year that someone died trying to get to church. I'm sure many of you had similar decisions to make about family gatherings over that weekend, and maybe for some of you, your family was near enough that you could safely gather together, but for others... Maybe the Spirit helped you realize that it was more important to see everyone safe and warm and alive a few days later, rather than risking life and limb to have people push through the storm. Which brings us back toward the decision that Joseph faced today. Joseph and his family had to risk life and limb to escape the storm of Herod's wrath. Around the time that Jesus was two years old, a delegation of learned wise men from the East, the Magi, arrive at the household of the Holy Family. They show up with gifts befitting a king because that is exactly who they seek out, the king of the Jews revealed to them through the stars in the sky, the portents of heaven. Again, I don't think Joseph would have put this anywhere on his vision board. One year from now, I'll be the stepfather to the Son of God. Two years from now, a noble delegation of foreigners will come knocking on our doorstep. I just don't imagine that that was in the plan. And after the wise men leave, Joseph gets another vision in a dream. A voice has told him that he needs to flee. They need to get out of Herod's reach because if the Magi had found them and the Magi had visited Herod and told Herod where they were going and who they were seeking, then it wouldn't be long before Herod's men find them too. We can imagine the panicked scene as Joseph bolts awake in a cold sweat as he grabs hold of Mary and instructs her to get Jesus and get ready to leave We can see him packing up some food and water, shoving some spare clothing into bags. Maybe they grab a trinket or two to remind them of home and family, but there's no time to hem and haw over what they can afford to carry and what needs to be left behind. They have to go. And then they leave their home for the final time, never to return to this place that will always be under the shadow of death for them. They venture into Egypt, the place where their ancestors, where, in fact, another Joseph encountered both shelter and slavery. And there, they will wait out the storm of Herod's wrath. At some point, they must have learned what happened after they left. They must have heard how Herod's men did arrive. Not long after their departure, they must have heard about the tragedy that befell their neighbors, how Herod's men killed all the boys aged two and younger so that there could be no contender for the crown. Imagine the guilt that they must have felt about being spared that suffering. Imagine the joy that they must have felt at still having their son with them. And then, one day, word arrives that Herod is dead. They're finally able to come up out of Egypt to return to the land of their own people. And yet the danger is not completely gone. Herod's son still sits the throne, 
And so they don't return home to Bethlehem. Instead, they go up into the land of Galilee and settle in a town called Nazareth. Again, this probably isn't in Joseph's life plan. Five years from now, why, five years from now, I'll be resettling my family after we spend a few years as refugees to escape sectarian violence. Year one, get married and become the stepfather to the Son of God. Year two, get visited by people who speak with kings and end up fleeing for our lives. Year four, move back out of Egypt. Year five, rebuild our entire lives. And here is where I want the story of the Holy Family to draw us beyond ourselves. With the relatively low stakes example of listening to the Spirit about traveling in a blizzard, we could see how sometimes it requires humility on our part to let go of the plans we had. With this example, we are invited into the practice of compassion. The Holy Family's flight into refuge is not unique. In the past year, more than 100 million people around the world were displaced from their homes, forced into scenes like the one that we just imagined of Mary and Joseph grabbing what they could and fleeing into the night. Of those 100 million, about 7.8 million people fled from Ukraine to escape the Russian invasion. Among the displaced, they were some of the fortunate ones, because for them, borders became permeable and resources were devoted to their rehoming and education. But for each Ukrainian who found refuge, many more from other parts of the world, from Tigray and Burkina Faso to Syria and Yemen to Myanmar, to all across Latin America, millions upon millions of people fled their homes in search of safety, to find borders closed, to find that the only place they would be resettled were impoverished camps without adequate food or water, with no place for their children to continue their educations. Each and every one of those families is the Holy Family. None of them had uprooting their lives and their five-year plans. And maybe I'm starting to lose some of you here because you're hearing in what I just said something too political. If indeed it is too political to say that we should see in every person the image of God, to suggest that we should treat people in their moments of greatest need with the same love and compassion that we would want in their position, then I am guilty as charged. Any day of the week, I would rather be judged by the world for professing a politics of love and mercy than to face the judgment of God for having allowed my heart to harden toward my fellow human. We all know from firsthand experience, in ways big and small, that life never goes exactly according to plan. How we respond to things going differently is what will make the difference for ourselves and those around us. We see plenty of examples online and in the news of people who respond to the unexpected with anger and cruelty. In fact, it's, it's so commonplace in our society that we come up with shorthand terms like Karens to describe people who lash out at others when things don't go exactly the way they wanted. But that kind of response, a response that's rooted in selfishness, is only making the world a worse place to live in. We must choose a better way. We must choose to have enough humility to step back from our expectations. We must choose to have enough trust in the Lord and in one another to see a new way forward. We must choose to have compassion, to see the divine worth of others who are going through their own unexpected difficulties. If we can choose this better way, then the world will be moved closer 
and closer to the kingdom of God with each and every act of humility, trust, and compassion. Amen. Please pray with me. God, you know that change is a constant part of our experience. It is said that we plan and you laugh. But I imagine that you must look with tenderness upon our misfortunes. You seek what is best for us, and yet you know that we don't always seek what is best for one another. Show us how to have compassion and grace toward one another in the midst of life's tumults so that we might move ever closer to the perfection of your kingdom. Amen.